These corpuscles seem to be the last thing in substance, its last known state of refinement, and already it is being proclaimed as the long sought for, primal matter, or ultimate substance. Whether or not a still finer state of substance will be discovered, science is unable to say, but thinks it unlikely. But we must not overlook the old occult teaching indicating a state of substance so fine that it is imperceptible, and only recognizable as apparently free force its covering, or vehicle of substance not being evident. This would seem to indicate a still further refinement of substance, although perhaps the corpuscle, or electron, will answer to fill the bill in the case. As to the corpuscle being primal substance, it must be admitted that its advocates have presented a very strong case. One of their most important points is that although molecules differ very materially from each other, according to their kinds, and while atoms likewise manifest very plainly their kind, the corpuscle seems to possess only one kind, no matter from what form or kind of substance it is thrown off. Just think what this means. It means that the finest particles of gold, silver, iron, hydrogen, oxygen, and all the rest of the elements are composed of identically the same material and exhibit no differences in kind. The elements are no longer simple. All substance is one, at the last analysis. The corpuscles seem to possess the same mass to carry the same charge of electricity to act precisely the same irrespective of their source. No difference in size, mass or character, as in the case of the atom all are identical, save in the rate of their vibration at the time of observation, which is simply a matter of more or less motion. Space seems to be flooded with these tiny particles these units of substance. They stream from the sun, the stars, and every body highly heated. Likewise they stream from the bodies of highly electrified substance. Groups of these corpuscles, absolutely identical in nature, size, mass, etc., constitute the atoms of the 75 elements, the kind of element seemingly being dependent upon the number and arrangement of the corpuscles, and possibly by their rate of vibration. Every atom is like a great beehive with a swarm of corpuscles vibrating, moving around each other, and upon their own centers. And, if by the action of intense heat, transmitted, or caused by interrupted motion or if by a strong electric charge some of these corpuscles are detached from the atoms, or possibly an atom broken up, they fly off through space at a marvelous speed of many thousand miles an hour. So we see that these wonderful corpuscles look very much like primal matter or ultimate substance the stuff out of which substance is made. And, taking you back to the chapter on the universality of life and mind, the writer would remind you that in their motions and evident attraction, etc., these corpuscles evidence the same life and mind that we observed in the molecules and atoms. It must be so, for what is in the manufactured article must be in the material of which the article is made. And so, even here, life and mind have not escaped us. Nor will it in the ether. And speaking of the corpuscles, as manufactured articles, we are reminded of Herschel's thought about the atoms, when they were regarded as primal matter and likely to be uniform, and, at the end, of one primal substance. Although Herschel's conception does not now apply to the atoms, it may be transferred to the corpuscles. Herschel thought that the fact that the particles of substance were likely to be found to be uniform in size, and identical in nature and characteristics, indicated that they might be akin to manufactured articles, turned out from the same great machinery of creation. This idea would indicate that the Creator applied the rules of careful manufacture to the manufacture of the particles, the uniformity operating in the direction of, 1. Economy of material, 2. Utility through interchangeability, replacing broken or discarded parts, etc., and also, 3. Conformity to a standard of size, quality, etc. The thought is interesting, and is mentioned here for that reason. It is not affected by the supposition that there may be a still finer and rarer form of substance, from which the particles are manufactured, in fact, the idea of Herschel, if closely analyzed, would seem to indicate some such raw material, from which the articles were manufactured. 
Chapter 7. The Paradox of Science In the days of the ancients, when the philosophers found themselves unable to account for any particular class of phenomena, they bundled it together and referred it to a supposititious something that they called, the ether. Finding this an easy way to get rid of vexatious questions, they fell into the custom and the habit grew upon them. Soon there were a dozen or more different kind of ethers in vogue, each explaining something else that, something else, by the way, being things that science now feels that it understands pretty well. These ethers grew to be like the various vapors, of the ancients a dignified term for, we don't know, a respectable road for retreat under the semblance of an advance. These ethers became a scientific scandal, and caused a lax mode of thinking among students of those times. And so they were finally abolished and relegated to the scrap pile of science, where they lay for many centuries until a comparatively recent period, when at least one of them was hauled forth, dusted, freshened up a little, and placed upon its old pedestal. This revamped ether, referred to, was the ether of Aristotle. Aristotle, as we know, was a famous Greek philosopher who lived about 350 BC about 2250 years ago. He was a good man and a celebrated philosopher, but was somewhat deficient in scientific knowledge. Although he knew many things, and uttered many wise thoughts, he was under the impression that the breath of man entered the heart instead of the lungs that the back part of the skull was empty, and so on. He was without the advantages of a modern training which, was not his fault, however. Well, Aristotle conceived the idea of an universal ether, which he thought pervaded all space, and with which he accounted for the passage of light from the sun and stars, the movements of the planets, and various other physical phenomena. It is not known whether Aristotle really believed in this ether, or whether he merely used it as a speculative hypothesis, following the ether habit of his contemporaries. At any rate, his theory served its purpose lived, flourished, declined and died at least seemed to be dead. But its corpse was resurrected in modern times, and used to account for diverse things. This does not mean that modern thinkers really believe in the universal ether they merely assume it as a working hypothesis until something better is offered. Its principal modern use is to account for the transmission of light from the sun and stars to the earth. It was held that a thing could not act where it was not, and so it became necessary to account for the transmission either by the theory that small particles of substance were thrown off from the sun and traveled to the earth, or else that there was some medium of communication by means of vibrations, etc. Newton held to the first theory, but his hypothesis went down before the ether advocates, who advanced the wave theory, although it seems that, like Banquo's ghost, Newton's theory will not stay down, and is now taking on a new lease of life, owing to the discovery of the corpuscle and radiant matter. The wave theory philosophers asserted that the light and heat of the sun were thrown off in the shape of force or energy, and transformed into waves, in and of a hypothetical ether, Aristotle's own, which waves were carried to the earth, where, meeting substance, they were again transformed into heat and light. It was known that light and heat traveled at the rate of 184,000 miles per second, and therefore the waves of the ether were considered to have that speed. The wave theory seemed to fit the facts of the case better than the Newtonian theory of corpuscles, although the latter has always been considered as better explaining certain phenomena than the new theory. And so the ether wave became generally accepted, and remains so today although recent discoveries are causing a disturbance in the scientific camp regarding the question. Later it was discovered that the electricity traveled at the same rate as light and heat, and the wave of the ether theory was thus thought to have additional verification, and electricity came under the law and remained there until the electron discovery, which is causing much disturbance, among those interested in the study of electricity. Briefly stated, the theory of the universal ether is this, that pervading all space in the universe not only between planets, stars and suns, but also, filling in the cracks, between molecules, and atoms as well there is a subtle substance in and through which the waves of light, heat, 
electricity, and magnetism travel at the rate of 184,000 miles per second. This substance is said to be matter that is not matter, in fact, science does not venture to say just what it is, although it freely states just what some of its properties must be, and, alas. These properties are most contradictory and opposite to each other, as we shall see as we proceed. This universal ether is purely hypothetical. It has been called a necessity of science, something assumed for the purpose of explaining or accounting for certain phenomena. It is undemonstrated and unproved in fact, may truthfully be said to be undemonstrable and unprovable. Some have gone so far as to say that its claimed properties and qualities render it unthinkable as well. And yet, science finds itself compelled to assume that the ether, or something like it, exists, or else cease speculating about it. It belongs to the realm of pure theory, and yet, many writers treat it as if it were a positively demonstrated and proven fact. Let us examine into the nature of science's problem, and her attempted solution, and the trouble arising therefrom. Light travels at the rate of 184,000 miles a second. Remember, that light and heat are that which we call by those names only when considered in connection with substance. According to the theory, light in the sun's atmosphere is transformed into a light wave of the ether on its travels to the earth, and only when the wave comes in contact with the substance on the earth's body or atmosphere does it become again transformed into light as we know it. In its travels through space it meets with no substance, and has nothing to turn into light, consequently space, between worlds, is in a state of absolute darkness. The same is true of heat, and interworld space is absolutely cold, although passing through it are countless heat waves of great intensity, which, later on, will be transformed into heat when they reach the substance, the earth. The same is true of electricity and magnetism. Although the ether, as we have seen, is a purely theoretical substance, yet science has found it reasonable to conclude that it must be possessed of certain attributes in order to account for certain known facts. Thus, it is said to be frictionless, else the worlds, suns and planets could not pass freely through it, nor could the light and heat waves travel at such a tremendous rate. It also is thought to have something like inertia, because motion once started in it persists until stopped, because it is at a state of rest until motion is imparted to it, and because it takes a fraction of time to impart motion to it. It is thought to be different from substance in any of its known forms, for many reasons, among such being the fact that no known form of substance could carry vibrations through space at the rate of 184,000 miles a second. And light and heat waves travel at that rate, and have forms and shapes, and lengths of their own. Light for instance, vibrates on two planes, and a light wave is something like a Greek cross, thus, dash, having a horizontal and a vertical line, or plane of vibration. And the ether cannot be a fluid of any degree, because a fluid cannot transmit cross vibrations at all. And it cannot be a solid, because a solid could not stand vibrations at such a terrific speed, and still remain a solid. And yet, to transmit the two plane light waves, the ether must have a certain degree of rigidity, else the waves could not travel. Lord Kelvin estimated this degree of rigidity as about 19 billionth of the rigidity of the hardest steel. So, you see, science is compelled to assume that the ether is a continuous, frictionless medium, possessing both inertia and rigidity. Some scientists have thought it to be a kind of elastic jelly. Of the ether, Professor Oliver Lodge has said, we have to try and realize the idea of a perfectly continuous, subtle, incompressible substance, pervading all space, and penetrating between the molecules of ordinary matter, which are embedded in it, and connected to one another by its means. And we must regard it as the one universal medium by which all actions between bodies are carried on. This, then, is its function to act as the transmitter of motion and energy. 
To give you an idea of the wonderful thing that science is compelled to think of the ether as being, by reason of the qualities it is compelled to ascribe to it although it confesses itself unable to, imagine, the nature of the thing, which it has created in bits by the adding and bestowing of qualities which were made necessary by the logical requirements of the case let us take a hurried view of the thing as the several departments of science say it must be thought of. To meet the requirements of the case, Science says that the universal ether must be substance infinitely more rare and evanescent than the finest gas or vapor known to science, even in its rarest condition. It must convey heat in the manner of an infinitely solid body and yet it must not be a solid. It must be transparent and invisible. It must be frictionless, and yet incompressible. It cannot be a fluid. It cannot have attraction for substance, such as all substance has. Nor can it have weight that is, it is not subject to gravitation. It is beyond the reach of any known scientific instrument, even of the greatest power, and it refuses to register itself in any way, either to senses or instruments. It cannot be known of itself, but may only be recognized as existent by the things for which it acts as a medium or transmitting agent. It must convey energy in motion, yet it must not take up any part of either from the matter in its midst. It must not absorb any of the heat, light or electricity. It must fill up the spaces between the worlds, as well as the most minute space between the molecules, atoms and corpuscles, or any other minute particle of substance, either known by name to science now or which may be discovered or imagined later as a necessity of some conception regarding the nature of substance. In short, the universal ether, in order to do the things attributed to it, must be more solid than solids, more vapor-like and gas-like than vapor or gas, more fluid than fluids, infinitely less rigid than steel, and yet infinitely stronger than the strongest steel. It must be a substance having the qualities of a vacuum. It must be continuous and not composed of particles, atoms or molecules. It must be an everything, in some respects, and yet a nothing, in others. It must not be substance, and yet it must carry substance within its ocean of dimensions, and, besides, interpenetrate the most minute space between the particles of substance. It must not be energy or force, and yet science has been considering energy and force as but interruptions of rest, or agitations, within, and of, itself. So you see that this mysterious, wonderful universal ether in order to be, at all must be a, something, possessing certain qualities or properties of substance many of the properties of qualities being exactly contradictory and opposed to each other and yet it cannot be substance as we know it. It is a paradoxical thing. It could only belong to another and an entirely different order of existence from that of substance as we know it. It must possess characteristics and properties of an order as yet unknown to us by name for which the material world contains no analogy for which substance has no analogues. It must be a far more complex thing than is even the most complex thing we call matter, or that which we call force or energy. And yet, it has been claimed that it would explain both yes, contain within itself the possibility of both. And yet, in face of what has just been said, the writer must confess, humbly and with a full realization of the enormity of the offense, that he supposes advancing a theory, a little further on in this book that will attempt to identify this something this universal ether with a something else that we know, although not through the senses or by means of instruments. Bear with him kindly, he begs of you, while he proceeds gradually along the path that leads to the theory. Scientists have compared substance moving through the ether as a coarse sieve moving through water, the latter making room for the passage of the sieve, and then closing up behind it. If this be amended by the idea that the moving sieve, while allowing the water to pass through it freely, still carries along with it a thin film of water which clings to the wires of the sieve by adhesion if there be admitted this clinging film as well as the body of the water through which the sieve moves then the illustration answers quite well as a crude illustration of substance and the ether. This fact is important in view of the theory that will be advanced further on in this book. Professor Lodge, 
in his interesting work, Modern Views of Electricity, mentions a number of experiments tending to prove the above-mentioned fact, which is not so generally known as other facts relating to the ether. Until the discovery of radiant matter, bringing with it the new theories of the corpuscle or electron, etc., brushed aside into the dust heap many generally accepted scientific theories regarding the nature of substance, the favorite and most popular theory was what was known as the vortex ring theory of the atom. This theory held that the atoms of substance were but vortex rings of the ether, having had motion communicated to them in some way, and which afterwards acquired other motions, and which finally become apparent to our senses as substance. In other words, the atom was supposed to be a vortex ring of ether, acted upon by force, in some unknown way, the character, nature and properties of the atom being determined by the shape and size of the vortex ring, the rate of motion etc., etc. The new discoveries of science, however, have set aside, at least temporarily, this vortex ring theory, and at present science seems to find its latest thing in substance, in the theory that substance at the last seems to be the corpuscle or electron. In other words, after many years of fancied security in a settled theory regarding the nature of substance, science once more finds itself compelled to take up the search for the origin of things. But the theory of the ether remains and is likely to although the names applied to it will change. By some it is still believed that in the ether, a little further removed, rests the origin of substance and that the corpuscle may be the vortex ring product, instead of the atom. It will be noticed that science has made no serious attempt to connect the phenomenon of gravitation or attraction with the ether. Gravitation stands alone an outsider, among the forces, responding to none of their laws needing no time in which to travel needing no medium like the ether in which to transmit, waves, fearing no obstacle or interfering body, but passing right through the same different, different, different. And we shall see why this difference, when we reach the point where our theory brings us to the point where we must substitute, something else, for that great paradoxical general solvent of modern science the ether of Aristotle. We shall reach the point after a brief consideration of motion, force, and energy. Chapter 8. The Forces of Nature. The substance filling the universe is in constant and unceasing motion. Motion is evidenced in every physical and chemical process and change, and manifested in the constant interchange of position of the particles of substance. There is absolutely no rest in nature everything is constantly changing moving and vibrating. Building up processes are ever at work forming larger masses or bodies of the particles and tearing down processes, disintegration and decomposition of molecules and atoms, and corpuscles, are constantly at work also. Nature maintains a constant balance among her forces. If the building up energies and forces were allowed full sway, then all the particles in the universe ultimately would gravitate to a common center, thus forming a compact and solid mass, which would thus dwell for eternity, unless the creative power should move upon it and again scatter its particles in all directions. And, if the tearing down, and dispersive forces and energies were allowed full sway, the particles would fly apart and would remain asunder for eternity, unless called together by some new creative fiat. But nature pits one force against another, maintaining an equilibrium. The result is constant play and interplay of forces, causing distribution and redistribution of particles, following the gathering together and building up processes. There is no lost motion or waste force. One form of force and motion is converted into another, and so on and on. Nothing is lost, all force is conserved, as we shall see as we proceed. In the public mind or rather, in the mind of that part of the public which think of the matter at all there seems to be an idea that force is something of the nature of an entity, separate from substance or mind something that pounces down upon substance and drives it along by presence from without. The ancient philosophers regarded substance as acted upon from without by an entity called force, substance being regarded as absolutely inert and dead. This idea, which is still held by the average person, owing, doubtless, to the survival of old forms of expression, 
was generally held by philosophers until the time of Descartes and Newton. This old idea was due to the teachings of Aristotle he of the ether theory and science and philosophy were timid about shaking off the Aristotelian dogmas. Others held that light, heat and electricity were fluids, conveyed from body to body in fact the general public still entertains this idea regarding electricity owing to the use of the term, the electric fluid. The present teaching of science is that force is the result of the motion of the particles of substance, and, of course, originates from within, rather than from without. It is true that motion may be communicated to a body by means of another body in motion imparting the same to it, but that does not alter the case, for the original motion came from the movement and vibration of the particles of substance, although it may have passed through many stages of transformation, change and transmission in its progress. The only exception to the rule is gravitation, which is a form of force, the nature of which is unknown to science, although its laws of operation, etc., are understood. We shall learn some new facts about gravitation in the forthcoming chapters of this book. It will be well for us to remember this fact, in our consideration of force and motion that force and motion originate from the inherent property of motion passed by the particles of substance, and come from within, not from without. This is the best teaching of modern science, and also, forms an important part of the theory of dynamic thought which is advanced in this book. Buchner, the author of Force and Matter, vigorously insists upon this conception, saying, among many other similar expressions, force may be defined as a condition of activity or a motion of matter, or of the minutest particles of matter or a capacity thereof. The term force is generally defined in works on physics as that which causes, changes or terminates motion. The word force is generally used in the sense of, in action, while energy is usually used in the sense of potential force capacity for performing work, the idea being that it is stored up force or force awaiting use. The term power is used in two senses, the first meaning a measure of mechanical energy, such as a 40 horsepower engine, etc. The second sense being capacity or ability to act or exercise force, this use being almost identical to the idea of energy, as above described, although, possibly, a little stronger expression. The materialistic school holds that force is a property of matter, the latter being regarded as the real thing of the universe. Others hold that force is the real thing, and that what is called matter, or substance, is but a center of force, etc. Others hold that the two are but aspects of the same thing, calling the thing by the name matter-force or force-matter. Heckel calls this combined thing by the name of substance, claiming that what are called matter and force are but attributes of it, the third attribute being sensation, which he holds is akin to mind, Heckel's substance is held to be eternal and self-existent its own cause, in fact. In this book the term substance is not used in this sense, but merely as synonymous with what science usually calls matter. The views advanced in this book differ materially from any of those above mentioned, it being held by the writer that all force is vital mental force, and, consequently, force as a separate thing is considered an unreasonable proposition what is called force being considered merely an action of mind upon substance, causing motion.
He also quotes, approvingly, the remarks of Nagilai, who said, if the molecules possess something that is related, however distantly, to sensation, it must be comfortable to be able to follow their attractions and repulsions, uncomfortable when they are forced to do otherwise. Heckel also says that in his opinion the sensations in animal and plant life are connected by a long series of evolutionary stages with the simpler forms of sensation that we find in the inorganic elements and that reveal themselves in chemical affinity. Is not this strong enough? Perhaps we may now be permitted at least to assume that even the atoms, molecules and corpuscles have something like sensation. Someone may now object that Haeckel speaks of contact between the particles, and that sensation by contact, even in an atom, is far different from sensation without contact, at a short distance. Quite right, but if the objector will take the trouble to review the teachings of science regarding the relation of the particles, he will see that the particles are never exactly in contact, except in moments of collision, which, by the way, they carefully avoid. The corpuscles, as we have shown, have plenty of room in which to move about, and they move in orbits around each other. The atoms combine, but there is always room between them, as may be seen by reference to the teachings regarding the ether, which fills up the cracks, according to the theory. And the molecules also have plenty of room, as may be seen by reference to that part of the subject, particularly to the comparison of the drop of water magnified to the size of the earth, in which the molecules would appear about the size of the original drop with more room between each than their own size. In fact, as we have been shown in a previous chapter, the particles are attracted only to a certain distance, at which they resist the impulse or attraction and stand off a bit. They will not be forced too near without creating disturbances and manifestations of force, and if they are separate beyond a certain distance the attractive power ceases to operate. But there is always some room between them, and they bridge over that room and exert and receive the attractive power in some way. This is true not only of the particles but of the great bodies, like the earth and planets, that are attracted, and attract over great distances. Now for the question, how do they exert sense and attractive power over the great comparative distance great, comparatively, as well in atom, as in planet and sun? Someone may answer the question closing the last paragraph with the word, electricity. Very good electricity, like the ether, comes in quite handy when one is forced to explain something not known. Electricity, like the, glacial period, Aristotle's ether, natural laws, and, suggestion, is a most handy weapon of argument, and often acts as a preventative to further inquiry and investigation until some sufficiently irreverent of precedent arises to ask, but why and how? and starts the ball rolling again. But, electricity, will not answer in this case, for the rate of the travel of electricity is well known 184,000 miles per second, which, fast as it is, assumes the crawl of a slow freight when compared with the instantaneous rate of travel of gravitation. And then electricity requires a medium, and gravitation does not, and in many other ways the two are seen to be totally different. And in the case of the space between the atom and molecule and corpuscle, it is no more reasonable to say, electricity, than it would be to say, heat, or, light, and, magnetism, is not available for obvious reasons. Remember that electricity, light and heat are caused by motion resulting from attraction, and the child cannot procreate the parent. Heat Light and electricity may beget each other, and they do. And gravitation may procreate heat, light and electricity. But heat, light and electricity cannot procreate gravitation never. And light, heat and electricity require replenishing from the common source of energy, but gravitation is self-sufficient and asks no replenishing or storage battery or powerhouse. Electricity, heat and light come and go, appearing, manifesting and disappearing, swallowed up by each other, or by substance. But gravitation is always their unchangeable unwavering immutable invariable something above matter and force something majestic, awe-inspiring, sublime. Does it take a wild flight of the imagination to see that this something, that is not matter, and nor force, 
must be a manifestation of mind? Let us first apply this idea of thought transference to the operation of the law of attraction between the corpuscles, atoms, and molecules of substance the particles of substance. The particles are believed to move to or away from each other in accordance with the workings of attraction and affinity, in its various degrees. First they must desire to move and not desire in the developed sense that we feel it, but still elementary feeling, or inclination, or tendency, call it what you will, but it remains rudimentary mental emotion and emotion leading to motion. This is not a pun look up the meaning of the word emotion and you will see its application. Then, following the desire, comes the action in the direction of gratifying it. The particles act to gratify desire in two ways acting at a distance, remember they exert the attractive force, which the writer believes to be mental force, transmitted by mind, projection, a mental or psychic bond or connection being thus established. By means of this bond of mind, the particle endeavors to, one, draw itself to the object, and, two, to draw the object toward itself. In the case of the molecule, this desire and movement seems to be mutual, and evidenced by and to all molecules alike, providing they be within molecular distance, as science calls it. But in the case of the atoms, it seems to be different for there is found a greater degree of choice or elective affinity. This election or choice is not altogether free, but depends upon the relative likes and dislikes of certain kinds of elements, as we have seen in previous chapters, although, to be sure, these elements are all made out of the same stuff in different combinations. The details of corpuscular attraction are not known, so it cannot be told whether preferences exist, or whether, in the words of the street, all corpuscles look alike to each other. It would appear, however, that there must be some reasons for preference, among the corpuscles, else they would always form in the same combinations always act alike to each other, as they are alike in other actions and thus there would be but one element or kind of atom, formed, instead of the seventy-five, already known. To be sure, in this case, it might be that the one kind of atom formed would be the atom of hydrogen, and that all other elements, or atoms, were modifications of that one just proving the dream of the scientists of the 19th century. But, as Kipling would say, that is another story. To return to the particle which we left trying to draw the other particle to itself, and itself toward the other. There is no material connection between them, and electricity and magnetism will not answer, so what is to be done? Evidently the particle knows, for it exerts a drawing power or force by means of the mental connection, and two come together. The particle evidently is able to exert a repelling or moving away power by reversing the process, the mental bond acting as the medium. This may cause a smile, because we have never seen an instance of bodies pulling themselves together by intangible bonds. Haven't we? Then how about two pieces of magnetized steel, or two electrified substances? Oh, that's different, you say. Why, different? Isn't the bond intangible? And, haven't we seen that both electricity and magnetism were mental actions also? Oh, er, but well, oh yes, that's it perhaps the attracting force is magnetism or electricity. No, that will not do for we have seen that electricity and magnetism were products of this attraction, not producers of it the attraction must come before electricity and magnetism, not after them you are mixing cause and effect. And, even if you were right and you cannot be wouldn't the electrical or magnetic force be called into operation, and directed by the mental action, arising from the desire? You cannot get away from mental action when you study the law of attraction. But, how about the fact that heat causes the particles to change their vibrations, and draw apart, and all that sort of thing and electricity, likewise, you may ask. Surely this takes the matter away from mental action, doesn't it? Well, the writer thinks that the phenomenon referred to only helps to prove his theory. And he will endeavor to so prove to you. The consideration of the facts related in this chapter, 
leads us to a supplemental proposition to our basic proposition, which may be stated as follows, Supplemental Proposition 1. Not only is the law of attraction the manifestation of a mental process, or vital mental action, but also the actual force or energy used in bringing the particles of substance in closer relation, in accordance with that law, is in its nature a vital mental force or energy, operating between bodies or particles of substance, without a material medium. Chapter 12. The Law of Vibrant Energy. In previous chapters we have seen that the phenomena of radiant energy, known as light, heat, magnetism and electricity, had their origin in the motion of the particles, the different classes of phenomena depending upon the particular degree in nature of the aforesaid motion of particles. We have seen also that radiant energy could be communicated or transmitted from one body of substance to another. And that the communication of transmission might be accomplished not only by close contact of the bodies, but by waves of some sort which were caused in some medium, the ether, by the vibrations of the particles of the body, and which waves, when they reached the other body, were transformed into vibrations of the particles corresponding to those manifested in the first body. The idea has been illustrated by the sending telephone, the sound waves in the diaphragm of which were transformed into waves of the electric current, and thus passing along the wires were transformed again into sound waves by the diaphragm of the receiving instrument. We have seen, also in the preceding chapter, that the medium by which these vibrations were transferred, transmitted, or communicated, might be supposed to be mind, the operation being akin to thought transference. Now let us examine into the workings of the matter. In the first place, we assume a certain state of vibration, existing in a certain body of substance heat, or electricity for instance, either illustration will answer. Another body of substance is brought in close contact with the first body, and the vibrations of energy pass on to the second, not by waves, but by a seeming actual passing of vibrations without the need of intervening waves. This, science calls transmission by conduction, the theory being that the particles rapidly pass on the vibrations from one to another. Convection or conduction along other forms of substance, such as hot air, hot water steam, etc., is but a variation of the above, as substance is the medium in both cases. The third form of transmission is by radiation, whereby the vibrations are transmitted by waves in some medium other than substance, according to the theory, as we have described in a preceding paragraph, as well as in previous chapters. As a matter of fact, a careful analysis of the matter will show that even in the conduction of the most solid substance, there must be a medium not substance between the particles of the substance, for the particles always have space between them this being true of the particles of air, as well as those of iron. So there is always space to be traversed by a medium not substance. But we need not stop to split hairs regarding this question, for the general explanation will explain this also. Now, to get back to our body of substance vibrating with radiant energy, separated from a second body of substance by a great distance thousands of miles in fact millions would be better let us take two worlds, for instance the sun and the earth. Ignoring for the moment the explanation of gravitations, which will be given later, and realizing that there is no medium of substance existing between the two bodies, we must grant that there is a medium not substance existing between them either permanently or thrown out for the purpose of this special transmission. We shall assume a medium existing before the need of the transmission, for reasons to be seen later. Our theory of dynamic thought, and thought transference between bodies of substance, compels us to suppose that this medium is a mental connection, or mental relation, existing between the two bodies of substance. So, we must consider the question of this medium of mind transmitting the vibrations of radiant energy from the sun to the earth. How can mind conduct radiant energy? It does not conduct radiant energy, but it does transmit not radiant energy but the mental state that causes radiant energy vibrations. This statement of a, a mental state causing radiant energy vibrations seems rather startling at first sight but let us examine it. 
We have seen that the radiant energy was caused by the motion or vibrations of the particles, which motion or vibration was the result of the workings of the law of attraction, and which law was but the manifestation of vital mental action. And, at the last, the vibrations of radiant energy are the result of peculiar or particular states of the life and mind of the particle. The word state is derived from the Latin word status, meaning position, standing, and is used generally in the sense of condition. This mental state of the particle may be described as a state of emotional excitement. Let us pause a moment to consider the meaning of these words it often helps us to understand a subject, if we examine the real meaning of the words defining it. Emotion is derived from the Latin word emotum, meaning to shake, to stir up, the Latin word being made up of two other words, i.e., e, meaning out, and modem, to move. Emotion is defined as a moving or excitement of the mind. Excitement is derived from the Latin word exciter, meaning to move out, the English word being defined as a calling to activity, state of active feeling, aroused activity. So you see that the idea of active motion and aroused activity of mind permeates the term emotional excitement that is used by the writer in connection with the mental state causing vibration of the particles of substance. The single word, excitement, will be used by the writer, hereafter, in the above connection, in order to avoid complex terms. To those who still object to the use of a mental term in reference to motion of substance, he might remark that science makes use of the term, excite, and, excitement, in reference to electrical phenomena, so that he is not altogether without support in the use of the word. Now to return again to our body of substance the sun the particles of which are manifesting a great degree of excitement, evidencing in vibrations producing the phenomenon of radiant energy. The excitement is shared equally by its particles, the contagion having spread among them. Even the particles of its atmosphere are vibrating with excitement and evidencing radiant energy. The sun is in direct mental connection with the earth, as we shall see presently, and the excitement is transmitted by thought transference, along this mental connection, in the shape of dynamic thought waves of excitement. These waves have a rate of speed of 184,000 miles per second why this particular rate, or any rate at all, is not apparent, it being very evident, however, that this particular kind of mental action excitement, or thought is not transmitted instantaneously as is the mental quality known as desire resulting in attraction, or gravitation, which seems to be rather a basic quality, rather than a temporary disturbance or emotional excitement. But the writer must not get ahead of his story. The excitement of the particles of substance composing the sun is contagious, and the thought waves travel along the mental connection, or medium, at a wonderful rate of speed. Soon they come in contact with the mental atmosphere of the earth and the excitement becomes manifest in action, the emotional excitement being reproduced by the particles of the earth's substance nearest the surface which vibrate and manifest the radiant energy in spite of themselves, for the tendency among particles is to settle down and remain calm, rather than to participate in emotional excitement. They have acquired a normal and fixed rate of vibration, or mental state, after many years, gradually changing from a high state of excitement to a comparative calm state. And, their tendency and inclination is conservative, and they are disposed to resent and repel radical states of excitement or disturbance, coming from other less conservative bodies. The above fact partially explains why the communicated excitement manifests itself more strongly on the surface of the body, exposed to the contagion of excitement. The conservative influence is always at work, and manages to absorb and equally distribute the energy that is beating down upon it, without allowing it to penetrate very far. The energy is used up or absorbed, and neutralized by the lower vibrations of the Massachusetts. The effort of the energy coming from the sending body is to bring up the vibrations of the receiving body to the rate of the sender while the effort of the receiving body is to resist this effort, and to reduce and bring down the transmitted increased rate of vibration of the particles immediately exposed to the contagion. 
In both cases the effort is toward equalization of the rate of vibrations. This working of the law may be observed plainly in the case of heat vibrations the energy seeming to wish to bring up the vibrations or temperature of the second body, while the latter resists this effort and strives to bring down the vibrations or temperature of those particles of itself that have caught the motion. The energy is like a radical agitator who wishes to stir up an excitement, leading to a change, while the body is like the conservative element that prefers to let well enough alone and resists the stirring up process and exerts itself to restore quiet and to maintain accustomed conditions. The explanation of the phenomenon given in any work on physics or natural philosophy will answer fairly well in the consideration of this theory of dynamic thought, the only important change being required, being the substitution of thought waves for waves of the ether of science. Science has described the working operations, as might be expected from her years of careful study and examination. She has erred only in the theory or hypothesis advanced to account for the facts. Her ether, handed down by Aristotle, is admitted by her to be paradoxical and unthinkable, but she has had none other to substitute for it. She will probably sneer at the dynamic thought and thought transference theory advanced in this book if indeed she takes the trouble to examine it. But sometime, from her own ranks among her most advanced members will arise a man who will claim that all force is mental force, and that transference of energy is thought transference. And the scientific world will accept the doctrine after it finds itself unable to fight it down and it will give new names and terms to its workings and it will proclaim loudly the new truth. And this little book, and its writer will be ignored but its work will go on. The writer although probably doomed to have himself and his theory laughed at by the masses of people, whose children will accept the teachings of this book, does not feel discouraged by the prospect. He cares nothing for personal credit the truth being the important thing. Like Galvini, whose words appear on the title page of this book, he may cry, I am attacked by two very opposite sects the scientists and the know-nothings. Both laugh at me, calling me the frog's dancing master, but I know that I have discovered one of the greatest forces in nature. The illustration given above of the transmission of the excitement of the particles of the sun to the particles of the earth, will answer equally well in the case of light, heat, magnetism and electricity. And it will answer in the case of the transmission of these forces between atoms, molecules, and masses as well as between worlds and solar systems. Any body subject to the law of attraction may and do, so transmit vibrations. In our consideration of the riddle of the Sphinx, which forms the subject of the next chapter, we shall obtain further particulars of the workings of the law. The consideration of the facts and principles stated in this chapter brings us to a second supplemental proposition, which may be stated as follows, Supplemental Proposition 2. The rates of vibration of the particles of substance may be likened to mental states, and a high degree of the same may be called an excitement. This excitement may be, and is, communicated from the particles of the body manifesting it, to the particles of other bodies the medium of such communication being a mental connection or mental relation existing between the two bodies of substance, without the employment of any material medium and which excitement, so communicated, reproduces in the second body the vibrations manifested in the first body, subject. Always, to the counteracting efforts of the second body to maintain its accustomed, and former, rate of vibration, and mental state. Chapter 13. The Riddle of the Sphinx. It is with no light emotion, or jaunty air, that the writer approaches this part of his subject. On the contrary, he feels something like awe when he contemplates the nature of that great something which he is called upon to attempt to explain in a few pages. He feels, in only a lighter degree, the emotion that one experiences when, in occasional moments, his mind leads to a contemplation of the infinite. He feels that that which men mean when they say, gravitation, and, the ether, 
are but symbols and feeble concepts of something so far above human experience that the mind of man may grasp only its lowest shadings, the greater and higher part of it, like the higher rays of the spectrum, being hidden from the experience of man. In his endeavor to pass on to you his ideas regarding the something that explains both gravitation and the ether, he must ask you to endeavor to form a mental picture of a something. This something must fill all space within the limits of the universe, or cosmos if limits it has. It must be an expression of the first of the attributes of the infinite the one called omnipresence, or presence everywhere, and yet it must not be the infinite presence. It also must be an expression of the second of the attributes of the infinite the one called omnipotence, or all power, and yet it must not be the infinite power. It also must be an expression of the third attribute of the infinite the one called omniscience, or all-knowing and yet it must not be the infinite wisdom. It must be an expression of all the attributes that we think of as belonging to the infinite and yet through them all we may see the infinite, itself, in the background, viewing its expressions. This something that you are asked to think of is that something regarding which the mystics have dreamed, the philosophers have speculated, the scientists have sneered and smiled that something that men have thought of as the universal mind or the cosmic mind. You are asked to think of this something as a great ocean of pure mind, permeating all space between solar systems between worlds between masses of substance between the molecules, atoms, and corpuscles. In and about and around everything yes, even in everything in the very essence of the corpuscle it is in truth it is that essence itself. Bound up in the bosom of that mighty ocean of mind must reside all knowledge of the universe of all, this side of God. For that all knowledge is but a knowing of its own region. Latent within itself must be locked up all energy, or capacity for force or motion, for all force or energy is mental. In its very presence it exemplifies the capacity of filling all space. Omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient all the attributes of the infinite are manifested in it and yet it is but the outward expression of that behind the veil, which is the causeless cause of all. In that great ocean of universal or cosmic mind, bodies of substance are but as floating specks of dust or even bubbles formed of the substance of that ocean itself on the surface of that ocean, there may arise waves, currents, ripples, eddies, whirlpools, storms, hurricanes, tempests, from its bosom may rise vapor, that after stages of clouds, raindrops, flowing in streams, rivers, bays, at last again reach the source of its origin. These disturbances and changes we call energy, force, motion but they are but surface manifestations, and the great ocean is serene in its depths, and, in reality, is unchanged and undisturbed. This, friends, is that which the writer asks you to accept in the place of Aristotle's ether. Is it a worthy exchange? We have seen that the attraction of gravitation was different from any other so-called form of force and energy both in its operations and laws, as well as in its constancy and self-support. And that it was different from the other forms of attraction such as cohesion, chemical affinity, etc. And, so we must consider it as more than a mere, emotional excitement, in the mind of the particle that bubble on the surface of the ocean. And it must be different from the special forms of attraction manifested by the atom and molecule. It must be a simpler, more basic, and yet a more constant and permanent thing. It must exist before and after, excitement, vibration, cohesion, and chemical affinity. It must be the mother of the forces. Let us imagine the cosmic mind as a great body of something filling space, instead of as the surface of the ocean, which figure we use just now either figure is equally correct. This great cosmic mind is to be thought of as filling space, and containing within its volume, oh, for a better word, countless worlds, and suns, as well as smaller bodies of substance. These suns and world, and bodies are apparently free and unconnected, floating in this great volume of mind. But they are not free and unconnected they are linked together by a web of lines of gravitation. Each body of substance has a line reaching out in a continuous direction, and connecting it with another body. 
Each body has one of such lines connecting it with each particular other body. Consequently, each body has countless lines reaching out from it, some slender, and some thick, the thickness depending upon the ratio of distances maintained by, and relative sizes of, the particular bodies that it connects. This system of lines form a great network of connections in the volume of mind, crossing each other at countless points, but not interfering with each other. And although the number may be said to be countless, still these lines do not begin to cover the entire dimensions of space, or of the mind that fills it. There are great areas of space entirely untouched by these lines. If one could see the system of lines, it probably would appear as a sheared-off section of a great spider's web, with lines in all directions, but with plenty of room between the lines. Perhaps these lines converge to a common center, and that center may be. But this is transcendental dreaming let us proceed with our consideration of the use of these lines. It is to be understood, of course, that these lines are not material lines not made of substance but rather conditions in the cosmic mind. Not thought waves arising from the excitement of particles, but something more basic, simpler, and more permanent. Let us look closer and we will see that the great lines of gravitation radiating from and connecting world with world sun with planet are really cables composed of much smaller lines, the finest strands of which are seen to emanate from each corpuscle or particle of substance the line of gravitation reaching from the earth to the sun being composed of a mass of tiny strands which connect each particle of one body with each particle of the other. The last analysis shows us that each particle is connected with every other particle in the universe by a line of attraction. These lines of attraction are what we call gravitation purely mental in nature lines of mind principle in the great volume of mind. These lines of gravitation must have existed from the creation of the particle, and the connection between particle and particles must have existed from the beginning, if beginning there was. The particles may have changed their positions and relations in the universe, but the lines have never been broken. Whether the particle existed as a free corpuscle whether combined as atom or molecule whether part of this world or sun or planet, or that one countless millions of miles removed it mattered not. The line of gravitation always was there, between that particle and every other particle. Distance extended and thinned the line, or the reverse, as the case might be but it was there, always. Obstacles proved no hindrance to passage, for the lines passed through the obstacle. Can it not be seen that here is the secret of the fact that no time is required for the passage of gravitation it apparently traveling instantaneously, whereas, in fact, it does not travel at all. And does not seem that this theory also explains why no medium is required for the travel of gravitation? And does it not explain why gravitation is not affected in its passage by intervening bodies? Gravitation does not travel or pass, it remains constant and ever present between the articles, varying in degree as the distance between the particles is increased and vice versa and increasing and decreasing in effect, according to the number of particles combining their lines of attraction, as in the case of atom, molecule, mass, world. Gravitation is a mental connection or bond uniting the mind in the several particles, rather than their substance or material. Along these lines of gravitation pass the thought waves, resulting from the excitement of the particles these fleeting, changing, in constant waves of emotion how different they are from the changeless, constant exhibition of gravitation. And along these same lines when shortened by close contact, travel the impulses of cohesion and chemical affinity. Gravitation not only performs its own work, but also acts as a common carrier for the waves of desire force and the thought waves of excitement of the particles, manifesting as attractive energy and radiant energy, respectively. The writer asks you to remember, particularly, that while the desire waves of the particles and their thought waves of excitement are changeable, disconnected, and inconstant, the line of gravitation is never broken and could not be unless the particle of substance was swept out of existence, in which case the balance of the universe would be overturned and chaos would result. 
The divine plan is perfect to the finest detail every particle is needed is known is counted and used in the plan. And gravitation is the plainest evidence of the reality of the infinite that is afforded us. In it we see the actual machinery of the infinite. No wonder that great thinkers have bowed their heads reverently before its power and awfulness, when their minds have finally grasped its import. Verily the sparrow's fall is noted, and known, as the biblical writer has recorded, for the fall is in obedience to that great law that holds the particles in their places that makes possible the whirl of worlds, and the existence of solar systems that, indeed, makes possible the forms of life as we know them that something that forever and ever has, and will, silently, ceaselessly, untiringly, and without emotion, fulfilled its work and destiny gravitation. The theory of dynamic thought also holds that in addition to the existence of the cosmic mind, or ocean of mind principle and the lines of attraction that run through it, each particle has its mental atmosphere, or aura. The aura is an atmosphere of mind that surrounds the particle and also the larger bodies and also living forms higher in the scale. This aura is merely an extension of the bit of mind that is segregated or apparently separated from the cosmic mind, for use by the individual particle, mass, or creature. Through, and by means of this aura the particle takes cognizance of the approach and nature of the other particles in its vicinity. The same rule holds good in the case of the creatures, including man, as we shall see in a later chapter. The fact is mentioned here, merely in order to connect the several manifestation of mental phenomena mentioned in the several parts of this book. Some may object to the theory of the lines of gravitation being the only carriers of the energy of the sun, as being contrary to the conception of science that the sun radiates energy in all directions equally, just as does a piece of hot iron, or a lamp. Answering this objection, the writer would say that there is a decided difference in the two cases. The iron or lamp radiates its heat and light to the particles of the surrounding air and other substance in close distance, the lines being very close together, so close in fact that they seem to be continuous and having no space between them, at least no space sufficiently large to be detected by the eye of man, or his instruments. But with the sun the case is different, for the distances are greater and the lines spread apart as the distance is increased. Draw a diagram of many fine rays emanating from a central point, and you will have the idea at once. If space were filled with substance, just as is the atmosphere of the earth the air, is meant of course then indeed would the lines practically be joined together, but as space between the worlds is almost devoid of substance, the lines between the sun and the other worlds, and planets, spread out rapidly as the distance from the sun increases. To show how this objection is really an additional proof of the theory the writer begs to call your attention to the fact that according to the calculations of the physicists in science, the sun's energy would have been exhausted in 20 million years, granting that it was dispersed equally in all directions during that time. But, note this, science in its other branches, namely in geology, etc., holds that the sun already has been throwing out energy for 500 million or more years, and seems able to stand the strain for many millions of years more. Thus science is arrayed against science. Does not this theory harmonize the two, by showing that the sun does not emanate energy in all directions, equally, and at all times but, on the contrary radiates energy only along the lines of gravitation, and in proportion to the relative distances and sizes of the bodies to whom such energy is radiated? The writer need scarcely state that in the short space at his disposal, in the pages of this book, he has been able merely to outline his theory of dynamic force, as applied to the inorganic world. The patience of the average reader has limits and he must pass on to other features of the workings of the theory, namely the mental life of man, in which the same laws are manifested. But, he feels that those interested in the phases of the subject touched upon, may explain for themselves the missing details by reference to the teachings of modern science on the subjects of physics, remembering, always, to substitute the theory of dynamic thought for the Dether theory that modern science borrows from Aristotle as a temporary makeshift. 
The writer believes that this theory will account for many of the missing links in physics a broad statement, he knows, and one either extremely impudent or superbly confident, according to the viewpoint of the critic. The writer may be able to throw a little additional light, probably, upon the question of the relation between gravitation and the excitement waves of radiant energy. Without attempting to go into details, he wishes to suggest that in view of the fact that the particles are connected by the lines of gravitation, any great, extended, and rapid disturbance of a number of particles would cause a series of undulating or wave-like movements in the lines, which might be spoken of as waves of agitation or unrest, in the lines of gravitation. This agitation, or unrest, of course, would be thus communicated to all other particles toward whom lines extended, the intensity or effect of such agitation or unrest depending upon the relative distances, and the number of particles involved. We may easily imagine how the intense and high rate of vibration among the particles of the sun, manifesting as intense heat, would cause a like high degree of agitation or unrest among the lines of gravitation the lines, dancing backward and forward, around and about, following the movements of the particles, and thus producing waves of gravitational agitation and unrest, which when communicated to the particles of the earth, would produce a similar excitement among the particles of the latter. In the same way that sunspots and consequent terrestrial electrical disturbance may be explained. While not absolutely tying himself to this particular conception of the details of the workings of the law, the writer feels free to say that he considers it a very reasonable idea, and one that in all probability will be found to come nearer to explaining the phenomena, than any other hypothesis. It certainly coincides with the undulatory wave theory of science. The idea is but crudely expressed here, for lack of space, it being impossible to attempt to go into details the mere mention of general principles being all that is possible at this time and place. And now, for a few additional words on the subject of our theory that in place of the hypothetical ether of science a substance that is not substance there exists a great ocean of cosmic mind. The idea is not without corroborative proof in the direction of the thought of advanced thinkers even among the ranks of science. While science has accustomed the public to the idea that in the universal ether might be found the origin of matter the essence of energy the secret of motion it has not spoken of a mind, in connection with this universal something. But the idea is not altogether new, and some daring scientific thinkers have placed themselves on record regarding same. Let us quote from a few of them it will make smoother our path. Edward Drinker Cope, in several of his writings, hinted at the idea that the basis of life and consciousness lay back of the atoms, and might be found in the universal ether. Dalbert says, possibly the ether may be the medium through which mind and matter react. Hemstreet says, mind in the ether is no more unnatural than mind in flesh and blood. Stockwell says, the ether is coming to be apprehended as an immaterial, superphysical substance, filling all space, carrying in its infinite throbbing bosom the specks of aggregated dynamic force called worlds. It embodies the ultimate spiritual principle, and represents the unity of those forces and energies from which spring, as their source, all phenomena, physical, mental and spiritual, as they are known to man. Dalbert speaks of the ether as a substance, which, besides the function of energy in motion, has other inherent properties, out of which could emerge, under proper circumstances, other phenomena, such as life, or mind, or whatever may be in the substratum. Newton spoke of it as a subtle spirit, or immaterial substance. Dalbert says, the ether the properties of which we vainly strive to interpret in the terms of matter. The undiscovered properties of which ought to warn everyone against the danger of strongly asserting what is possible and what is impossible in the nature of things. Stockwell says, that the ether is not matter in any of its forms, practically all scientists are agreed. Dalbert, again, says, if the ether that fills all space is not atomic in structure, presents no friction to bodies moving through it, and is not subject to the law of gravitation, it does not seem proper to call it matter. One might speak of it as a substance if he wants another name for it. 
As for myself, I make a sharp distinction between the ether and matter, and feel somewhat confused to hear one speak of the ether as matter. And yet, in spite of the above expressions, no scientist has dared to say in plain words that the ether, or whatever took the place of the ether, must be mind, although several seem to be on the verge of the declaration, but apparently afraid to voice their thought. In view of what we have seen in our consideration of the facts and principles advanced in this chapter, we are invited to consider the following two supplemental propositions. Supplemental Proposition 3. Connecting each particle of substance with each and every other particle of substance, there exists lines of mental connection, the thickness of which depends upon the distance between the two particles, decreasing in proportion as the distance is increased. These lines may be considered as conditions of the great ocean of cosmic mind which pervades and fills all space, including the essence or inner being of the particles of substance, as well as the space between the said particles. These lines are the lines of gravitation by and over which the phenomenon of gravitation is manifested. These lines of gravitation have always existed between each particle and every other particle, and have persisted continuously and constantly, throughout all the changes of condition and position and relation that the particles have undergone. There is no passage or transmission of energy or force of gravitation over these lines, or any other channel, but, on the contrary the energy or force of gravitation is a constant and continuous mental connection or bond existing between the mind of the particles, rather than between their substance or material. Supplemental Proposition 4 The lines of gravitation, mentioned in the preceding proposition, are the medium over which travel, or are transmitted the thought waves resulting from the excitement of the particles, and by which waves the mental states are communicated or transmitted. The same medium transmits or carries the mental force of attraction cohesion, chemical affinity, etc., evidencing in the relation of the particles to each other. Thus gravitation not only performs its own work, but also acts as a common carrier for the waves of excitement manifesting as radiant energy, and the waves of desire force manifesting as attractive energy. And here, the writer rests his case in the action in the form of advanced thought, entitled, The Theory of Dynamic Thought versus The Theory of Aristotle's Ether, in which he appears for the plaintiff. He begs that you, the members of the jury, will give to the evidence, and argument, due consideration, to the end that you may render a just verdict. Chapter 14. The Mystery of Mind. The writer, in this book, has treated the two manifestations of life, viz. mind and substance, as if they were separate things, although he has hinted at his belief that substance, at the last, might be found to emanate from mind, and be but a cruder form of its expression. The better way to express the thought would be to say that he believes that both substance, and mind as we know it, are but expressions of a form of mind as much higher than that which we know as mind, as the latter is higher than substance. But he does not intend to follow up this belief, in this book, as the field of the work lies along other lines. The idea is mentioned here, merely for the purpose of giving a clue to those who might be interested in the conclusions of the writer, regarding this more remote regions of the general subject. The writer agrees with the ancient occult teachings regarding the existence of the cosmic mind, as he has stated in the last chapter. This cosmic mind, he believes, is independent of substance, in fact it is the mother of substance, and its twin brother, mind as we know it. Mind, as we know it, and substance are always found in connection with other. It is true that the form of substance, used by mind as its body, may be far finer than the rarest vapor that we know, but it is substance nevertheless. The working of the great plan of the universe seems to require that mind shall always have a body with which to work, and this rule applies not only in the case of the densest form of substance and the mind principle manifesting through it, but also in the case of the highest manifestation of mind, as we know it, which requires a body through which to manifest. This constant combination of mind and substance the fact that no substance has been found without at least a trace of mind, 
and no mind except in relation to and combination with substance, has led many scientific thinkers to accept the materialistic idea that mind was but a property of substance, or a quality thereof. Of course, these philosophers and thinkers have had to admit that they could form no idea of the real nature of mind, and could not conceive how substance really could think, but they found the materialistic idea a simpler one than its opposite, and so they fell into it. Notwithstanding the fact that there was always a something within that would cry, Shaw, at the conclusion of the argument or illustration, these men have thought it reasonable to believe that there was no such thing as mind, except as a result of irritation of tissue, etc. But, nevertheless, there is always a something in us that, in spite of argument, keeps crying like a child, taint so. And, wonderful to relate, we heed the little voice. This materialistic theory is a curious reversal of the facts of the case. Even the very conclusions and reasoning of these thinkers is made possible only by the existence of that mind which they would deny. The human reason is incapable of explaining the inner operation of the mind upon a strictly and purely physical basis. Tyndall, the great English scientist, truthfully said, the passage from the physics of the brain to the corresponding facts of consciousness, is unthinkable. Granted that a definite thought and a definite molecular action of the brain occur simultaneously, we do not possess the intellectual organ, nor apparently any rudiment of the organ, which would enable us to pass by a process of reasoning from the one phenomenon to the other. The materialist is prone to an attempt to rout the advocates of mind with a demand for an answer to the question, what is mind? The best answer to that question lies along the proverbial Irishman's lines of answering a question by asking another one, resulting in the answering question, what is matter? As a fact, the human reason is unable to give an intelligent answer to either question, and the best opinion seems to be to consider them as but two aspects of something, the real origin of which lies in something higher, of which both are aspects or forms of expression. The occult teaching, with which the writer agrees, is that the mind, inherent in any portion of substance, from the corpuscle up to the brain of man, is but a segregated, or apparently separated, portion of the universal mind principle, or cosmic mind. This fragment of mind is always connected with substance, and, in fact, it is believed that it is separated from the universal mind, and the other separate minds by a film of the rarest substance, so fine as to be scarcely distinguishable from mind. This separation is not a total separation, however, for the fragment of mind is in connection with all other fragments of mind, by mental filaments, and besides is never out of touch with the cosmic mind. But, comparatively, the fragment of mind is apart from the rest, and we must consider it in this way, at least for the purpose of study, consideration, and illustration. It is like a drop in the ocean of mind, although connected, in a way, with every other drop, and the ocean itself. The individual mind is not closely confined within the substance in which it abides, but extends beyond the physical limits of the substance, sometimes to a quite considerable distance. The aura, or egg-shaped projection or emanation of mind, surrounding each particle and each individual, is an instance of this. In addition to the aura, there is possibly an extension of mind to a considerable distance beyond the immediate vicinity of the physical limits, the connection, however, never being broken during the life term. Mental influence at a distance, however, does not always require the above-mentioned projection of the mind. Thought waves often answer the purpose, and, besides, there is such a thing as the imparting of mental vibrations to the small particles of substances with which the atmosphere is filled, which vibrations continue for quite a time, often for a long period after the presence of the individual producing them. These matters shall be discussed in later chapters of this book. The mind of man is a far more complex thing that is generally imagined by the average man. Not only in its varied manifestation of consciousness, but its great region of below consciousness, or infra consciousness, as it is called. It shall be the purpose of the sequel to this book, now in preparation, 
which will be entitled, The Wonders of the Mind, to describe these inner workings, and to point out methods of utilizing the same. Our next chapter, entitled, The Finer Forces of the Mind, will lead us into this field. Chapter 15. The Finer Forces of the Mind. It was the writer's original intention to close the book with the chapter in which he brought to a close his argument and presentation of the case of dynamic thought. The book was written for the purpose of demonstrating that theory, and it naturally should have closed there. The writer has in simultaneous course of preparation a companion book, entitled The Wonders of the Mind, in which, in addition to information and instruction regarding the latent powers and hidden regions of the mind including an investigation of the infraconscious and ultraconscious regions, automatic thinking, occult systems of mentation, mental development, and unfoldment, etc. He purposes taking up the subject of dynamic thought from the mental plane of man. And he thought it better to keep the two branches of the subject separate and apart. But, notwithstanding the above facts, he feels that he cannot close the present book the consideration of the present phase of the subject, without at least a passing reference to the fact that dynamic thought is fully operative on the plane of human mentation, as on the plane of atomic mentation. In fact, man has the same power, potentially, that is possessed by the atom, only refined to a degree corresponding to the development of man as compared to that of the atom. The power is raised to a higher plane of mentation, but is fully operative. Just as the body of man contains physical life corresponding with the different stages of lower physical life, mineral, vegetable, and animal for instance, the mineral-like bones, and the mineral salts in the system, the plant-like life and work of the cells, and the animal-like flesh, and physical life, in addition to the wonderful brain structure and fine brain development. Peculiar to man so has man the lower mental qualities of the lower life, in addition to his glorious human consciousness. That is reserved for the highest form of life on the globe. In his mental regions, man has the power of the atom of attracting particles of substance to him, that he may combine it with other substances in building up his body then he has the plant-like cell mentation, that does the building up work, and repairs wounds, and damaged parts, etc. Then he has the animal mentation evidencing in the passions, desires, and emotions of the purely animal nature, and which mentation, by the way, keeps man busy in controlling by means of his higher mental faculties, that are God's gift to man, and are not possessed by the animals. But all this will form part of the sequel, The Wonders of the Mind, and are merely mentioned here in passing. And, just as man is enabled to use elementary the physical qualities that he finds in his body, and to turn same to good account in living his human life, so does man, consciously or unconsciously, make use of these elementary mental powers in his everyday mental life. And if he but realizes what a conscious use of these faculties, guided by the human will, will do, man may become a different order of being. This is the basis of the occult teachings, and the mysteries of the ancients, as well as the teachings of the modern secret esoteric bodies and societies, such as the Rosicrucians, and Hermetic Brotherhood, and several other societies whose names are not known the real societies are referred to, not the brazen imitations that unscrupulous men are holding out to the public as the original orders. Membership being offered and urged for the consideration of a few dollars. It is needless to say that membership in the real occult orders is never urged, and cannot be bought. But to return to the subject the individual mind of man is in direct touch, not only with the great cosmic mind, but also with the individual mind of every other man. Just as the particles are bound by lines of attraction, so are the minds of men bound together by lines of mind, or mental filaments. And just as special forms of attraction exist between the particles, so do special forms of attraction exist between men. And just as particles are influenced at a distance by other particles, so are men influenced at a distance by other men. And just as the particle draws toward itself that which it desires, so do men draw toward themselves that which they desire. And just as mental states and excitement are transmitted, or communicated from particle to particle, 
so are mental states or excitement transmitted or communicated from men to men. As above so below as below so above, says the old occult maxim, and it may be found to operate on every plane. The phenomena of thought transference, telepathy, telesthesia, mental projection, suggestion, hypnotism, mesmerism, etc., etc., may be explained and understood by reason of an acquaintance with the theory of dynamic thought, as explained in this book. An understanding of one gives you the key to the other for the law operates precisely the same on each particular plane. If the reader will think over this statement, and then apply it to his investigations and experiments, he will find that he has the key to many mysteries the loose end of a mighty ball of thread, which he may unwind at his leisure. Let us begin by a consideration of the process of thought production in the human mind. In this way we may arrive at a clearer idea of the mental phenomena known as thought force, mental power, thought waves, thought vibrations, mind transference, mental influence, etc. To understand these things we must begin by understanding the process of thought production. Here is found the secret of the phenomena named, and much more. In the first place, while the brain is the organ of the mind the instrument that the mind uses in producing thought, still the brain does not do the thinking, nor is the brain matter visible to the eye, the material instrument of thinking. The brain, and other portions of the nervous systems, including the little brains, or ganglia, found in various parts of the body, is composed of a certain substance a fine form of plasm, which however is but the groundwork of foundation for finer forms of substance used in the production of thought. Science has not discovered this finer substance, for it is not visible to the eye, or to the finest instruments, but trained oculists know that it exists. This fine substance escapes the scalpel and microscope of the biologists and anatomists, and, consequently, their search for mind in the brain is futile. There is something more than tissue to be irritated in the brain. But, remember, that this something more is still substance, and not mind itself. Thought is a form of excitement in this fine brain substance, which we may as well call psychoplasm, from the two Greek words meaning the mind and a mold or matrix, respectively the combined word meaning the mold or matrix of mind, in other words the material substance used by the mind in which to cast or mold thoughts. This excitement in the psychoplasm manifests in vibrations of its particles for, like all substance, it has particles. All scientists agree that in the process of thinking there is an expenditure of energy, and a using up of material substance. Just how this is affected, they do not know, but their experiments have shown that there is energy manifested and used, and also substance consumed. The secret of the production of thought does not lie in the brain or nervous system, which are but the material substratum upon which the mind works, and which it uses as a mold or matrix for the production of thought. Thought is the product of mind directing force upon substance in the shape of psychoplasm. And energy is manifested in the production of thought just as much as in the operation of the law of attraction or chemical action. What force and energy may be asked? The answer is mental force. But although the answer stares them right in the face, Scientists deny that mind contains force or energy within itself, and persist in thinking of force as a mechanical thing, or as necessarily derived from the common forms of energy, such as heat, light or electricity. They ignore the fact that mind has a finer force which it uses to perform its work. How do the atoms attract each other and move together? There is an evidence of force and energy here that is not heat, light or electricity what is it? When a man wishes to close his hand, he wills that it be closed, and sends a current of this finer force of the mind along the nerve to the muscle, and the latter contracts and the hand is closed. A similar process is used in every muscular action. What is the force used? Science admits the existence of this force, and calls it, nervous energy, or nerve force. It holds that it must be something like electricity, and some even go so far as to say that it is electricity. 
They base their ideas upon the fact that when electricity is applied to the muscle of living or dead animals, they contract just as they do when this nerve force is applied, and every movement of the muscles may be so produced by electricity, which becomes a counterfeit nerve force. But, here is the point, this force cannot be identical with electricity, for none of the appliances for registering electric currents will register it. It is not electricity, but is some finer force of the mind, generated in the material substratum that the mind uses as a base of operation. This fine force of the mind is generated in some way in the brain and nervous system, by action upon the psychoplasm. The brain, or brains, for man has several centers worthy of that term, are like great dynamos and storehouses of this force, and the nerves are the wires that carry it to all parts of the system. More than this, the nerves have been found to be generators of force, also, as well as the brain. Experiments have shown that the supply of force in a nerve vanishes when the nerve is used, in which case it draws upon the storehouses for an additional supply. This fine force of the mind is really the source of all energy, for as we have shown in previous chapters, all motion arises from mental action, and this form of force or energy is the primal force or energy produced by the mind. And this force is in operation in all forms of life, from the atom to the man. And not only may it be used by the particle, but man, also, has it at his disposal. As a proof that substance is used up, and energy manifested in the production of thought, science points to the fact that the temperature of a nerve rises when it is used, and the temperature of the brain increases when it is used for extended thought. Scientists have claimed, and advanced a mass of proof to back up the same, that thought was as much a form of energy as was the pulling of a train of cars, and was attended by the production of a definite amount of heat, resulting from the activity of the fine substance of the physical extended resistant and composite substratum. But, science has taken all this to mean that thought and mind were purely material things, and properties of matter. It has claimed that, matter thinks, instead of that mind uses the matter or substance, in its finer forms, as a substratum for the production of thought. Buchner, the leader of the purely materialistic school, claims positively that thought is but the product of matter. He says, is it not a patent fact, obvious to all but the willfully blind that matter does think? De La Metri made merry over the narrowness of the mentalists, in saying, when people ask whether matter can think, it is as though they asked whether matter can strike the hours. Matter, indeed, as such, thinks as little as it strikes the hours, but it does both, when brought into such conditions that thinking or our striking results as a natural action or performance. The above quoted opinion of Buchner shows how narrow and one-sided a talented man may become by reason of shutting out all other points of view, and seeing only one phase of a subject. The example of the hour striking is a poor figure for the materialists, for although matter does strike the hours, it does so only when wound up by man under direction of his mind. And in the manufacture, adjustment, and winding of the clock, mind is the cause of the action. And, more than this, the very action of the coiled spring that is the immediate cause of the striking, results from the mental effort of the particles of the spring endeavoring to resume their accustomed position, under the law of elasticity, as explained in our chapters on substance. Science renders valuable service in showing us the details of the mechanism of thought, but it will never really explain anything unless it assumes the existence of mind, back of and in everything. It may dissect the brain cells, and show us their composition, but it never will find mind under the scalpel, or in the scale or test tube. Not only is this true, but it cannot even discover the fine psychoplasm which is used in the production of mind. But we may make use of its investigations regarding the matter of activity of brain substance in the process of thought, and by combining them with our belief regarding the existence of mind we may form a complete chain of reasoning, without any missing links these missing links appearing both in the case of the no-mind philosophers and the no-matter metaphysicians. This theory of mind and substance considered as the two aspects of something higher, from which both have originated or emanated, will come to be regarded as the only thinkable proposition 
in the end. And, with this idea in view, we may use the facts and experiments of the materialists, while smiling at their theories. And, with but a slight change of words, we may turn against them their own verbal batteries. In this way, we may take Molescott's famous statement, thought is but a motion of matter, and render it intelligible by making it read as follows, thought produces motion in matter. This finer force of the mind is in full evidence to those who look for it, and although it may not be registered by the scales or instruments designed to register the coarser grades of force, still it is registered in the minds of men and women, and in the actions resulting from their thoughts. These living registers of the force respond readily to it, and every one of us is such a register. Just as is the force a much higher grade of energy than the forms usually considered as comprising the entire range of energy, so are the instruments required for its registration much higher than those used to determine the degrees of heat, light, electricity, and magnetism. It may be that the future will give us instruments adapted for the purpose in fact it begins to look even now as if the same were forthcoming. But whether we have such mechanical instruments, or not, the living instruments give us a sufficient proof of the existence of the force, and its operation. Well the writer still finds himself unable to bring the book to a close. He added this chapter, to show that the property of dynamic thought extended to the highest development of mind, as well as abiding in the lowest. And, now that he has ventured upon the subject, he finds himself impelled to give you a few instances of the workings and operations of that law, in the case of human mental life. And this means one more chapter but only one, remember. The book must come to an end sometime remember. And, so we will pass over into another chapter, which will be entitled, Thought in Action. Chapter 16. Thought in Action. Without attempting to go into details, or to enter into explanations, the writer purposes taking his readers on a flying trip through the region of thought in action or dynamic thought in operation in human life. The details of this fascinating region must be left for another and more extended visit, in our next book, before mentioned, which will be called The Wonders of the Mind. But he thinks that even this flying trip will prove of interest and instruction. Let us start with a hasty look at man himself. Not to speak of his seven planes of mind, which belongs to the next visit, we find him a very interesting object. Not only has he a physical body, apparent to our senses, but he has also a finer or astral body, which he may use, unconsciously or consciously, when he learns how, for little excursions away from the body, during his lifetime. This astral body is composed of substance just as his denser physical body. The field and range of substance extends far beyond the powers of ordinary vision, as even the materialists must admit when they talk of radiant matter, ethereal substance, etc. Then he has currents of fine force coursing through his nervous system, which may be seen by those possessing astral vision, if the teachings of the occultists be true. Then he, like the particle, has an aura or egg-shaped projection of mind and fine particles of psychoplasm, which has been thrown off in the process of thought, and which clusters around him, producing a mental atmosphere, which constantly surrounds him, and makes itself felt by those coming in his presence. Those who read these words may remember, readily, the feeling they have experienced when coming in contact with certain people how some radiated an atmosphere of cheerfulness, brightness, etc., while others radiated the very opposite. Some radiate a feeling of energy, activity, etc., while others manifest just the reverse. Many likes and dislikes between people meeting for the first time, arise in this way, each finding in the mental atmosphere of the other, some inharmonious element. These radiations are perceived by others coming into their range. Occultists tell us that the character of a man's thought vibrations may be determined by certain colors, which are visible to those having astral sight. There is nothing so wonderful about this, when it is remembered that the various colors of light, comprising the visible colors of the spectrum, ranging from red, on through orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and terminating in violet, arise simply from different rates of vibration of the particles of substance. 
And as thought is produced by mind causing vibrations in the psychoplasm, why is not the astral colors reasonable? We cannot stop to consider these colors in detail, but may run over the ones corresponding to each marked emotion of thought, as reported by the occult teachings. For instance the shade of the thought manifesting in physical or organic functions, is of a colorless white, or, color of clear water, and the color of the thought manifesting in fine force or vital energy, is that of air, heated air arising from a furnace or heated ground when it emerges from the body although of a faint pink when in the body itself. Black represents hate, malice, etc., gray, bright shade, represents selfishness, while gray of a dark dull shade represents fear. Green represents jealousy, deceit, treachery, and similar emotions, ranging from the dull shades which characterize the lower and cruder forms, to the bright shades which characterize the finer, or more delicate forms of tact, politeness, diplomacy, etc. Red, dull shade, represents sensuality and animal passion, while red, bright and vivid, represents anger. Crimson, in varying shades, represents the phases of love. Brown represents avarice or greed. Orange represents pride and ambition, and yellow, in varying shades, represents grades of intellectual power. Blue is the color of the religious thoughts, ranging, however, through a great variety of stages, from the dull shade of superstitious religious belief, to the beautiful violet of the highest religious emotion or thought. What is generally known as spirituality is characterized by a light blue of a peculiarly luminous shade. Just as there are ultra-red and ultraviolet rays in the spectrum, which the eye cannot perceive, so occultists inform us there are colors in the aura or mental atmosphere of a person of unusual psychic or occult development, the ultraviolet rays indicating the thought of one who is pursuing the higher planes of occult thought and unfoldment while the ultra-red is evidenced by those possessing occult development, but who are using the same for base and selfish purposes, black magic, in fact. There are other shades, known to occultists, indicating several highly developed states of mind, but it is needless to mention them here. But the influence of these particles of thought stuff thrown off from the mind's psychoplasm under the vibrations produced by the mind during the process of thought does not cease with the phenomena surrounding the aura. They are radiated to a considerable distance and produce a number of effects. We will remember how the corpuscles or electrons are thrown off by substance in a high state of vibration. Well, the same law manifests in the vibrations attendant upon the production of thought. The particles are thrown off in great quantities each vibrating at the rate imparted to it during the process. No these particles of thought stuff do not compose the thought waves, the latter belong to a different set of phenomena. These particles of vibrating thought stuff fly off from the brain of the thinker, in all directions, and affect other persons who may come in contact with them. There is an important rule here, however, and that is that they seem to be attracted by those minds which are vibrating in similar thought rates with themselves, and are but feebly attracted and in some cases, actually repelled by minds vibrating on opposite lines of thought. Like attracts like, in the thought world, and, birds of a feather flock together, here as elsewhere. Some of these particles of thought stuff are still in existence, and vibrating, which proceeded from the minds of persons long since dead, the same being emitted or thrown off during the lifetime of the persons, however. Just as a distant star, which was destroyed hundreds of years ago, may have emitted rays which are only now reaching our vision, years after the destruction of the star which emitted them and just as an odor will remain in a room after the object causing it has departed the particles still remaining and vibrating and just as a stove removed from a room may leave heat vibrations behind it so do these particles persist, vibrate, and influence other minds, long after the person who caused them may have passed out of the body. In this way, rooms, houses, neighborhoods, and localities may vibrate with the thoughts of people who lived there long ago, but who have since passed away or removed.
These vibrations affect people living in these places, to a greater or lesser extent, depending upon circumstances, but they may always be counteracted or changed, if they are of undesirable nature, by setting upon positive vibrations on a different plane of mind, or character of thought. The mind of a thinker is constantly emitting or throwing off these particles of thought stuff, the distance and rate of speed, to and by which they travel, being determined by the force used in their production, there being a great difference between the thought of a vigorous thinker, and that emanating from a weak, listless mind. These projections of thought stuff have a tendency to mingle with others of a corresponding rate of vibration, depending upon the character of the thought. Some remain around the places where they were emitted, while others float off like clouds, and obey the law of attraction which draws them to persons thinking along similar lines. The characteristics of cities arise in this way, the general average of thought of their inhabitants causing a corresponding thought atmosphere to hang over and around it, which atmosphere is distinctly felt by visitors, and often determines the mental character of the persons residing there, in spite of their previous characteristics that is, unless they understand the laws of thought. Some neighborhoods, also, have their own peculiar mental atmosphere, as all may have noticed if they have visited certain, tough, neighborhoods, on the one hand, and neighborhoods of an opposite kind, on the other. Certain kinds of thoughts and actions seem to be contagious in certain places and they are to those who do not understand the law. Certain shops seem to have their own atmosphere some reflecting confidence and honest dealing, and others radiating an atmosphere that causes patrons to hold tightly to their pocketbooks, and, in some extreme cases, to be certain that their buttons are tightly sewed on their garments. Yes, places like people, have their distinctive mental atmospheres, and both arise from the same cause. And each person draws to himself these particles of vibrating, thought stuff, corresponding with the general mental attitude maintained by him. If one harbors feelings of malice, he will find thoughts of malice, revenge, hate, etc., pouring in upon him. He has made himself a center of attraction, and has set the law into operation. His only safe course is to resolutely change his thought vibrations. A most remarkable form of these particles of thought stuff is evidenced in the case of what are known among occultists as thought forms, which are aggregations of particles of thought stuff energized by intense and positive thought, and which are sent out with such intensity and positiveness, that they are almost vitalized and manifest almost the same degree of mental influence that would be manifested by the sender if he were present where they are. This highly interesting phase of the subject would take many chapters to describe in detail, and we must content ourselves with a mere passing view. To those who are interested in the subject, the writer would say that he purposes considering them at considerable length, in the forthcoming book, The Wonders of the Mind, which has been alluded to elsewhere. Besides the operation of these particles of thought stuff emitted during the production of thought, there are many other phases of thought influence, or thought in action. The principal phase of this phenomena arises from the working of the law of attraction between the respective minds of different people. Just as are the particles of substance united and connected by lines of connection, so are the minds of men connected. And the strong pull of desire manifests along these lines, just as it does in the case of the atoms. There has been much written of recent years regarding this, drawing power of the mind, and although some of what has been written is the veriest rubbish and nonsense, yet under it all there remains a strong, form, substantial substratum of fact and truth. Men do attract success and failure to them people do attract things to them as strange as it may seem to the person who has not acquainted himself with the laws underlying the phenomenon. There is no miracle about all of this it is simply that the law of attraction is in full operation, and that people of similar thoughts are drawn together by reason thereof. The workings of this law are somewhat intricate, but all of us are constantly using them, consciously or unconsciously. We draw to ourselves that which we desire very much, or that which we fear very much, for a fear is a belief, and acts in the direction of actualizing itself, sometimes. But, again, as Kipling would say, but, that's another story. This phase of the subject is a mighty subject in itself, 
and the half has not been told even by the many who have written of it. The writer intends to try to remedy the deficiency in his next book, however. Then, again, the excitement of thought in the minds of people may be transmitted or communicated to the minds of others, and a similar vibration set up, under certain conditions, and subject to certain restraining influences just as in the case of the particles of substances in a body or mass of substance. And, in many ways that will suggest themselves to the reader who has mastered the contents of the earlier chapters of this book, the phenomena of dynamic thought in the case of the atoms, and particles, may be, and are duplicated in the case of individual minds of men. The reader will see, readily, that this theory of dynamic thought, and the facts noted in the consideration thereof, give an intelligent explanation for the respective phenomena of hypnotism, mesmerism, suggestion, thought transference, telepathy, etc., as well as of mental healing, magnetic healing, etc., all of which are manifestations of dynamic thought. Not only do we see, as Prentice Mulford said, that thoughts are things, but we may see just why they are things. And we may see and understand the laws of their production and operation. This theory of dynamic thought will throw light into many dark corners and make plain many hard sayings that have perplexed you in the past. The writer believes that it gives us the key to many of the great riddles of life. This theory has come to stay. It is no ephemeral thing, doomed to die a borning. It will be taken up by others and polished, and added to, and shaped, and decorated, but the fundamental principles will stand the stress of time and men. Of this the writer feels assured. It may be laughed at at first, not only by the man on the street, but also by the scientists. But it will outlive this, and in time will come to its own perhaps long after the writer and the book have been forgotten. This must be so for the idea of dynamic thought underlies the entire universe and is the cause of all phenomena. Not only is all that we see as life and mind and substance illustrations of the law, but even that which lies back of these things must evidence the same law. Is it too daring a conception to hazard the thought that perhaps the universe itself is the result of the dynamic thought of the infinite? Oh, dynamic thought, we see in thee the instrument by which all form and shape are created, changed and destroyed we see in thee the source of all energy, force and motion we see thee always present and everywhere present, and always in action. Verily, thou art life in action. Thou art the embodiment of action and motion, of which Siddle hath said, Wherever our eyes dwell on the universe, whithersoever we are carried in the flight of thought, everywhere we find motion. Suns, planets, worlds, bodies, atoms, and particles, move, and act at thy bidding. Amidst all the change of substance among the play of forces and among and amidst all that results therefrom there art thou, unchanged, and constant. As though fresh from the hand of the infinite, thou hast maintained thy vigor and strength, and power, throughout the eons of time. And, likewise, space has no terrors for thee, for thou hast mastered it. Thou art a symbol of the power of the infinite thou art its message to doubting man. Let us close this book with the thought of the greatness of this thing that we call dynamic thought which, great as it is, is but as the shadow of the absolute power of the infinite one, which is the causeless cause, and the causer of causes. And in thus parting company, reader, let us murmur the words of the German poet, who has sung, Dost thou ask for rest? See then how foolish is thy desire, the stern yoke of motion holds in harness the whole universe. Nowhere in this age canst thou ever find rest, and no power can deliver thee from the doom of activity. Rest is not to be found either in heaven or on earth, and from death and dying break forth new growth, new birth. All the life of nature is an ocean of activity, following on her footsteps, without ceasing, thou must march forward with the whole. Even the dark portal of death gives thee no rest, and out of thy coffin will spring blossoms of a new life. Finus. The End. Thank you for being with us until the end. We hope you had a wonderful time. If you enjoyed our book, 
please support us by liking and leaving comments. We look forward to seeing you soon with another book. Best regards.